to the Kiwi Man Buzz. Hi, well, this is uh, Gary here from the Kiwi Man Buzz, and this this week we've got uh, we're talking to James Moore, and he's based in uh, Portland, Oregon. Is that right, James? Yes, Portland, Oregon. Yeah, and that's up by Washington State, isn't it? Oregon, is. right? Right. Um, we are Portland lies just south of the Columbia River, which separates Washington from Oregon. Oh, okay, fantastic. Yep, that's great. And how did you get started in, in your beekeeping? Uh, I've I've only been beekeeping two years, and let's see, how did I get started? My wife and I have a, a kind of an urban homesteading project going on with our house. We have about 20 fruit and nut trees planted on our property. And our property now is, is a standard a standard lot in the U.S. It's 50 feet by 100 feet, so it's 5,000 square feet. Um, okay. so it's, okay. it's not very large. So we've, we've tried to create density with the... Um, the the shrub the the fruiting shrubs and uh, fruit trees and vines and things like that and uh, a very popular thing to do here in Portland is to have a chicken coop but uh, I had no interest in raising chickens and bees seem to be seemed like they would be a very nice complement to all of our gardening and whatnot and they don't take up a lot of space yeah that's so, true. And I, I just happened to be, uh, I just happened to get started right as uh, a, a fairly powerful movement has started here in Portland of treatment-free beekeeping. Uh, so I, I kind of got in on the ground floor of a small beekeeping club that's now quite large. Um, we have about 60 to 70 people attend our meetings every month that's focusing on on uh, raising awareness about the um, various sort of ways that, yeah, yeah. and also bees pursuing without chemicals. Oh, that's fantastic! So, what what do you um, how do you treat your how do you do how do you treat for all mites in, or you don't? Well, here here's the thing that's 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 the trick, and that is, I personally I don't. Um, we have a, a, a Oregon State University has a bee lab, and they're about an hour south of us. Dr. Ramesh Sagili heads that lab up, and they have done studies of the most of the more popular Varroa treatments and found that they, using those treatments, they could not really do better than the control. And these were the treatments that were considered non, mm, relatively non-toxic to the bees. Um, Things like your hop, hop guard, I think is one. You know, th- there's uh, several of them on the market. Oh uh, yeah, that's the one that uses hops, isn't it? Yes, by, exactly. Um, I think that's by Vita. Is that right? I, I'm not. I, I don't know who makes it. Anyway, I, I say that to, because we we have some. Our club is being really strongly backed by this B Lab, and what we're the. The avenue that we are pursuing collectively is we we don't treat, and as amateur beekeepers, if we lose fifty percent of our hives, it, it's it, it is a, a financial hit. But the hope is that that hive that survives our long wet springs and survives the high varroa mite load, when they come through the next year. We can we can catch those swarms that that hive will inevitably produce, and build up a better stock of queens here for our climate. Yeah, sounds fantastic. Oh, that's great! And does does your club have a website? Yes, it is oh, yeah. port, portlandurbanbeekeepers.org. dot org. Portland Urban Beekeepers dot org. Okay, well I'll, I'll add that to the show notes. Great for those people. Oh, that that sounds like a fantastic um, idea for a club, and sort of something different, eh? Because mo- most traditional clubs are all, always, you know, they're always in the uh, throw pesticides in your hive kind of brigade, aren't they? A lot of them. Yeah, and 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 our club, um, our club website doesn't. We don't. We don't really step out and say we only promote treatment free. Uh, we're yeah. we're open to everyone, and we we want all kinds of beekeepers to come to the club, but. 
Um, if you come to the meetings, you listen to our speakers, you know, it's, it's really focused on what, how we can breed better bees. Yeah. Because we just need better bees. Yeah, because at the end of the day, you're trying to breed bees that can actually live, can coexist with the varroa mites, aren't you? Exactly. Yeah, we're not going to eradicate the varroa. We need, we, need, we need more hygienic bees is what it boils down to. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think America's probably an advantage because you've had them for a lot longer. So you, mm. you, that, those traits are coming out more and more, aren't they, I think, for the American bees? Yeah, um, the we're in a time kind of a tough situation because if you're a a uh, Portland beekeeper, your queens will come from Kona, Hawaii, or Northern California, and both of those areas have very different climates from our our climate here in Oregon, and so we're it's we're getting hit from both both directions. We've got bees that aren't accustomed to long really long wet springs you know our spring goes into june and it's raining all that time bees that aren't accustomed to the long wet springs and that aren't accustomed to the varroa like we seem to have here so a a side project of portland urban beekeepers is a, a a local queen breeding company that is being started by the president of our club so we hope within two or three years we're going to have locally bred queens that are going to be heavily optimized for resistance to varroa and our climate. Oh, that sounds fantastic! Yeah, they have a similar program here, but it hasn't. They haven't had a lot of success with it yet. So yeah, in New Zealand, but it's, it's it a, takes a long time. It's a long process because you, you can't. Yeah, you can't rush genetics, can you? Or you know, breeding and stuff like that. So. No, and and um, you, if you're going to be, if you're going to do it right, you have to be very picky. You know, you're you're only going to take the top ten percent of your class of bees, and the rest get pushed out of the way. Yeah, absolutely. So, so how many hives have you currently got at your place then? Uh, just two. I yeah. was hoping to grow into a third, but um, wasn't wasn't able to get a swarm. And and my my stronger hive that did swarm swarmed up into a very tall cherry tree, which I had to let them go. Oh, that's that's sad. I mean, that happens. I've had similar situations. They go up too high, and you can't get them. Too high. Yeah. Yep. Apparently, if you can, if you go below it and bang pots together they, they come down but i've never seen it happen so i i've heard that same thing and i i haven't uh i haven't i haven't spoken to anyone who's actually seen it work yeah it's a, but i think it's an old uh old wife's tale to be honest or, yeah. or an old, old beekeeper's tale yeah yeah so so how, how are your bees currently going because you got you guys are in spring now eh? is, it, is it still raining a lot or is it starting to come summer or um let's see this past week uh was quite rainy but we had Several weeks before that, they were gorgeous, um, perfect. We're just the the nectar flow started mm, started about a, two weeks ago, and we have a, a really strong blackberry uh, nectar flow. The blackberries provide the bulk of the nectar in our area. Um, so once we get into July, we've got three solid months, no rain. And that's when the bees just really go crazy. Oh, okay, fantastic. Well, I suppose you could look at splitting your hives then if you if you wanted to. Um, yeah, I may. I've got my hive that made it through the winter is not looking so hot right now. That was the one that swarmed, and and it may have swarmed it again. My wife and I uh, are just, as you know, we're just off of a three week bicycling trip in France. Yeah. And I, I, I had no idea what the bees did while I was gone, but the one hive was just not, not looking so hot. Oh, okay. So Sounds like they I did may, swarm, yeah. Yeah, I may try splitting the, the stronger one or do what's called a deep divide into a, and start a, a, a fresh colony and tear, tear down the old one if, if, they, if they don't survive. So yeah. we'll see. Okay, that's, that's good. And so what? What's one thing that you wish you knew now that you, before you started beekeeping? You know, that you'd... Oh man! Everything cool. Oh, what's the I, uh, what's the biggest thing? Let's say. 
I wish I I knew to expect 50 per, 50% losses regularly because that's what beekeepers in our area are facing right now. Oh, that's shocking, eh? Yeah. So what what do you think the high, losses are so high there? Is it just because um is it is it to do with pesticides or to do with varroa mites or what's the cause? Yeah, we we just at our last meeting were talking about this. Um, there is a a website called beinformed.org, b e e informed.org. And that is a um I don't know if coalition is the right word, but a group of bee researchers here have conducted a a nationwide survey of beekeepers, large and small, to gauge their losses. And uh, so far, that was where that 50% number came from that I gave you. The beekeepers in our area had about 50% losses. And they, they they haven't crunched all the data yet to know for sure, but... Um, you know, d- disease brought on by Varroa, I think, is considered to be the thing that just hammers our bees. As you probably know, you know, most of the commercial beekeepers, if not all of them in the entire U.S., ship their bees into California every year for the almond harvest, or I'm sorry, the al- the almond pollination. Yeah. So you got you got bees from the East Coast traveling thousands of miles to the West Coast. And then getting shipped back, and so there's a, a large amount of cross contamination of disease that happens. Yeah, so it, you know, it's a good way to spread diseases across the whole country, isn't it? Quite quickly. It it sure is, but unfortunately, our almond industry has built themselves a really giant monoculture out there in those almond orchards. So they they have to have the bees brought in. Yeah, yeah. I think we, we're kind of lucky in New Zealand. We don't have any kind of huge monocultures like that. So. It's quite mm-hmm. good. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's disheartening, isn't it? 50% losses every year. So The commercial the commercial guys, I think, averaged about 40% in our area. The amateur beekeepers just, you know, the, I think they're always just going to do a little worse than people who are managing really heavily. Yeah. And how do you how do you count the overall mites in your, um, in your, in your hives there with the best way? Uh, I did a... Um, Last summer, I did a, a sticky board, you know, that yeah. slides slides under the screen bottom board, and uh, I did a rough count that way. And then our bee lab, we can um, any beekeeper in the area can take a uh, a certain sized container, and you 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 lift a frame up and kind of run this cup down on top of the bees, and the bees fall into the cup, and you cap it, and you throw them in the freezer. You, you capture about. 400 or 500 bees, throw them in the freezer, and then you send them down to the bee lab, and they will um, dissect the bees and uh, tell you if uh, they are, there was evidence of uh, tracheal um, tracheal mites, what your varroa load is. And so I did that as well for both of my hives, and one hive had a very high varroa mite load, and the, the other hive had a very low varroa mite load. Yeah. Load, so. Oh, but we do a similar thing. We call it a, a sugar roll. Where you, you do that, but you put icing sugar in it. Yeah, yeah, that's similar. That. That's that's quite good because um, it's similar to an alcohol wash, but except you don't kill the bees. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, you just roll them around, and then you put them back in the hive, and you shake all the varroa mites out, and so it mm-hmm. works really well. Mm-hmm. We, we must do a video about that for our uh, blog. Show people how to do it. But that, that's that's good, working very well. But it's very intrusive. And you can't do it without opening the hive, obviously. So, mm-hmm. but um, oh, it's cool. So, so what do you think is what do you think is the biggest issue facing beekeeping today in the world in your area? Well, it it's got to be the the consistent heavy-handed use of these of these pesticides. I mean, they're they're being used indiscriminately. Yeah. And and used indiscriminately before the true effects of them are really known. So we, yeah. we learn too late. Yeah, and I think a lot of it, the testing is not very, um, it's not long-term testing, is it? They kind of like, 
you know, test them for a few minutes on a B, and then they they go, oh, that's okay, you know. Yeah. But they don't. There's no. There's no. I think the other thing is there's no testing on the brood. There's no mm. testing on the young and the hives, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's uh. Mm. You've probably heard that Monsanto is starting up a bee research lab. Yes, yes, I heard that. And I heard which, uh, Bayer are doing a similar thing too. Which par- part of me says that's that's awesome PR. You know, I, I, I really, I think the proof is going to be in the pudding. You know, in a few years, we'll see if they're actually able to show us that they can avoid killing our bees. Yeah, yeah, I'm not really sure what their intentions are, eh? so we'd have to we'd have to wait and see, I guess. Um, yeah. Hopefully they can, you know, hopefully they can do something, I guess. And so, what, what's your what's the most exciting thing you've done in beekeeping so far? Um, I think the the work that I've done. Um, putting sensors into the hive and and also with with swarmy although swarmy is a in the very early it's a very large large experimental project that's in the very earliest stages yeah maybe you could could explain just to the listeners what swarmy is and how you do it because it's, it's an iphone <coughs> app isn't it it's an iphone yeah swarmy is an iphone app um right now swarmy is basically in its its initial release and what it simply does is records a sound level from a mic that you place in or um, beneath your hive. And it provides two very specific audio filters. Um, one is a filter that's centered at around 250 hertz. And and uh, trails off on both sides, so it, it filters everything on the high and the low end of 250 hertz. And the second filter is one that filters out everything below 3,000 hertz. Um, and those two values come from research done by a guy named Eddie Woods, who was a BBC radio engineer in the 50s, and. He was a beekeeper and discovered, because he's an audio engineer and had headphones on all the time, was probably listening to the world through all kinds of sound filters constantly, he discovered that bees produce all kinds of different sounds depending on what's happening inside the hive. The queen piping phenomenon is probably the most well-known, and and, um, if you haven't heard it in person, it's... It's unbelievable. Yeah, I have heard that. It's quite impressive. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a really cool thing that they can do. Um, the two the two specific phenomenon that he focused on was one that every beekeeper is familiar with, and that is if you say you, you if you have a Langstroth hive and you're taking your your lid off and you've got an inner cover, and you crack the inner cover with your hive tool, if you've got a lot of bees sitting on the cover or just below it, you know, you'll hear a very short, sharp, short, sharp hiss from them. It's like a defensive reaction. Or if, you're, if you've been handling a frame and maybe you, you dropped it, the, the bees will react. Well, you can, if, if you put your ear, before you even open the hive, if you put your ear up to the hive body and you give it a, a good solid knock with your hand, you, you will hear that same sound. And what Eddie discovered is that when a hive is not queen right, the bees do not make that sound. Uh, also, when the bees are preparing to swarm, the intensity of that sound uh, decreases. So what might be a zzz becomes a zzz, or, you know, it, it, it loses intensity, it increases in duration. They sound like drunk, lazy bees. Oh, okay. Not, not defensive bees. It's a, it's a defensive reaction. So the, the, the 3,000 hertz filter in Swarmy will let you hear that sound very 
well. It, 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 um, because below 3000 Hertz, you get rid of a lot of the ambient uh, buzzing. And what you get is that, that quick, that quick push of the bees breath that they do to produce this, this reaction. And actually what you hear with your naked ear sounds like buzzing. And what you hear with the sound filter sounds, mm, uh, it's, it's a different sound for sure. It's, it come, it comes from a quick exhalation of their, of their breath. So that's the, that's the hiss. Um, and that's a great, uh, what I consider to be a really great diagnostic tool for, for your hives. Because if, if you're like me and you don't want to get into your hives very often, because personally I, I don't want to disturb the bees, um, you can just put your ear up to the hive and just give it a knock. And you hear a short, sharp hiss, bees are good. You got a queen, they're happy, they're defensive. If you don't, well, then maybe it's time to do an inspection. Yeah, that's fantastic. So, so you could use it like um, you could record it every day, and it and it, it it changes over time, doesn't it? So you can so it kind of predict when it's going to swarm. Is that a fair analysis of it? Well, <clears throat> yeah, and that that's getting into the experimental nature of of swarming. So let me uh, just uh, briefly mention the other uh, filter. This one. This one gets into a little bit more of the theoretical side, but Eddie Woods, um, if you go to my website, I have a, a, a really great uh, original recording by Eddie Woods from probably the early 60s, where he has uh, great audio examples of all these sound phenomenon. Um, the, the, the other filter, the 250 hertz filter, uh, is centered at that point because that is about the frequency of a a younger bee when the when the bees first emerge they beat their wings at a, a higher frequency than older bees and what eddie discovered is that uh as the workers uh if if, if collectively the hive is preparing to swarm the workers will start to starve off starve the queen a little bit, you know, re reduce her body mass in yeah. preparation to fly. And that leaves uh, a lot of the youngest uh, workers who would normally be tending to her idle. And they, they, they just sit around and beat their wings. They don't have anything to do. And it, when you listen to that sound, um, w when you're in that stage where they're preparing to swarm, there's a, there's the background um, frequency of the bees, which I'm, I think is two, 220 or so, 220 hertz. And then you've got the worker bees, these, these really young workers, and they're at about 250. And it produces the interference of those two frequencies. This produces a, like a little bit of a warbling sound. If you've, I mean, I see a guitar and you're in, in, in the back there, you know, oh, it's yeah, yeah. playing two, two notes where one string is slightly out of phase, you know, that warbling effect. Oh yeah. Yeah. So you, you hear a little bit of that, but you, I mean, Eddie could hear it because he had perfect pitch, I'm sure. But, um, with this filter centered at 250, you can get, uh, a really good, um, audio snapshot of that warbling. Uh, I have unfortunately have not observed that audio phenomenon myself. I'm, I'm going off of Eddie's research. So the idea with Swarmy is, is that every, however often you want, you go out and you turn on the 250 Hertz filter and you record a sound level and you just keep doing that. And if you're observing a um, an increase in the sound level uh, centered around 250 hertz, um, then you may have idle workers, which may be an indication that your hive's preparing to swarm. And personally, my goal is not to help people to prevent swarming, although you can certainly you know go in and manage manage queen cells and things like that. But my, my hope is that. After once we've gathered enough data and make swarmy 
be a better predictive tool that I can know my hive's going to swarm tomorrow and hopefully be there for it. Yeah, and you can do something about it. I, I guess, yeah, I guess, well, I guess the best thing, if you think it's going to swarm, you could probably do a split. You know, you could do a yeah. full swarm before they do yeah. it. Yeah, but uh, I, I think it, it's, it's a, a big benefit to the bees if we could make that decision without going in and doing a more invasive inspection. Or at least doing that inspection and then finding that the bees were not preparing to swarm and then you kind of went in and disturbed them for nothing. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So. Yeah, because the problem, yeah, sorry, I mean, the, that's a problem with um, the thing you were talking before about, you know, when a, a swarm, a hive swarms, you've got no prediction of where it's going to go. You know, it could be the top of a tree, it could be 10 miles away, well, not 10 miles away, but like, it could be quite a distance away and, and at mm-hmm. least just sitting there all day watching them, you're not going to ever, you might not even realise it, you know. Mm-hmm. Especially with hobbyist beekeepers, they're not, they're not, they're not at home all day. They're not, you know, watching their yeah. own So we've uh, we've had several members in our club be very successful with swarm traps uh, this summer. So, so you know, w- when we get better at building uh, swarm traps, if you have a, if you have the sense that the bees are going to swarm, like make sure your make sure your traps are fresh, and maybe you'll come home from work and you'll have caught a swarm yeah true yeah we, we've we had a few of those last season and we um caught a few they're quite good what yeah. do, you, do you um what do you put in them do you just put um lemongrass oil or what do you use for them yeah uh uh that's that's one thing uh also if you've got some old brood comb that you can stick up in there that re- that's a that's a great attractant to the bees. Yeah, absolutely. The only problem with that is that I find they get taken over by wax moss. Yeah, because ah. we, we had a um, swarm lord last season, and it's completely it was completely taken over by wax moss. So, uh, chance, okay, you might you might even find that it is um, bees going in there if it's full of wax moss. We our wax moth problem isn't terribly bad here. Oh, that's well, that's good. It's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, oh, that's that's true. Yeah, you could you can use that. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, old, old brood brood comb is good, but it does. Yeah, as I said, it does attract the wax moth sometimes. Because uh, generally, they when they first swarm, they go quite close to the hive, don't they? And then the next the next stage is like about up to three k's away usually. Yeah, yeah, fifty feet. I think is our kind of rule of thumb. I have an apple tree behind in my neighbor's property behind my house that the bees seem to like swarming too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, that's a perfect place to hang a swarm lure next to you, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, mm. yeah absolutely. Yeah, we were lucky because I, I saw one actually coming out one year and, and it was only about six metres from the hive, so it was quite an easy capture. Yeah, that's great. Very. That's There's great. nothing like uh, being there when your hive swarms. It's a very amazing phenomenon. Yeah, true. True. Oh, okay. And what are that? So that yeah, that swarmy sounds really interesting. So people can buy that on i um i is it the, um Apple Store? Is it what's, right? Yeah. What's, the, what's the correct word for it? App Store, isn't it? That, that Apple App Store, iPhone App Store. And I, I just want to say that I think the one thing I've struggled with the the thing I've struggled with with swarmy is conveying the idea that it the app does not predict swarming what what it is is it's a di- at this stage of the game it's a diagnostic tool and what i hope is that beekeepers who are experimenting with swarmy can report back to me and we can build a little community of people who are using this this audio diagnostic and advance the science a little bit because it i mean since eddie woods figured this out 60 years ago, he developed a, a little analog thing that he called the app addictor, does the exact same thing that Swarmy does, oh, takes okay. a sound level, and allowed beekeepers to put a mic in their hive and tell, you know, if the sound levels were changing. And I, all, I've just recreated his hardware device in software. I mean, the, the science hasn't advanced in 60 years, so I, I want to see it pushed forward because I think it's a really... Un, um, untapped resource of information. 
Oh, well, that's yeah. Well, we'll have to try and get some um, our listeners to uh, get hold of it. And so, can you? Do you have to have a, a mic inside your hive, or do you? Can you use the um, built-in mic on the actual iPhone, or is that not sensitive enough? Uh, I think it it's probably sensitive enough, but just li- uh, it, it's probably tough to take a reading with the built-in mic. I um, one thing I I've heard one guy. Um, has done is he took a, a little electret microphone and attached it to the end of a stick and then it plugged it into the iPhone and then you just you you put it underneath the screened bottom board so you it allows you to get the mic in the right place without you know putting your phone under there and you you want consistent as consistent a reading as possible each and every time so this the stick method might be a good way to go and I have some I have a page on my website that kind of describes how I built, how I modified a standard Langstroth frame to enclose a, a small microphone so that I have a little, I just have the plug hanging out of the side of the, the hive that I can just plug into when I want to take a reading. Yeah, that's a great idea. Did, um, so how do you stop them propolizing that? Or do you just, um, is it covered over with a mesh or something, is it? Yeah, I build a small wooden frame in and kind of cut the comb away and then stapled a metal mesh over that. The, the first one I built, I used a plastic mesh. And yeah. when I finally went in and retrieved that frame, they had eaten away all the plastic and eaten away the little fuzzy tip that goes over the microphone and and um, sealed the mic into the frame with the uh, burr comb and propolis. So they, they did a pretty good job on that one. <laughs> My, yeah. the, the, the new one is, is it's, it's much more better protected. Yeah. They don't like anything foreign in their hives, do they? That's for no. sure. They, they don't seem to be minding all the sensors that I have in there right now, but again, it, it's, it's behind metal mesh, so they can't really do anything to it. Yeah. So, so what other sensors do you have? Is it like things like temperature and things like that in your hives? Yeah, um, I have a uh, upper and lower temperature and humidity, and then um, outside pressure, temperature, and humidity, and yeah. that's um, being being sent wirelessly back to a computer I have in my basement, and then I, I send that data up to a site that rolls the data up for me and allows me to um, graph it and look at it. Oh, and I also have a bee counter. Oh, okay. Uh, How does that work? Is that like through the um, entrance? Yes. Uh, let's see. I don't think that the I have a, a bee counter that was designed by a friend of mine here in town, Tom Hudson. Um, he has, uh, if you're familiar with the site Instructables, he has a write up on how he designed and built it. It's a it's a printed circuit board that he designed with um, pairs of uh, infrared LED and phototransistors. Okay. okay. And it's it uh, it creates twenty two gates that the bees have to walk in or out through, and it sits in front of the entrance. And um, I have a a sm- It's a, got a small uh, Arduino microprocessor that sits on top of it that runs the code to count the bees. Oh, wow. Oh, you left the email with the uh, link to that, and I'll uh, put, add that to the show notes. Okay. Yeah, that'd be useful. And um, and your website's jmore.me, isn't it? That's it. Yeah, I'll, I'll add it to the show notes as well. And so, so what, what's what's your plans for this season then, coming up? Well, that's a great question. I have one one hive that's very questionable right now, and I've been I've been out of town so much lately. I haven't had a chance to really get in because we've all also been hit with rain. Um, but I'm gonna get in. I'm gonna get into that hive tomorrow. Hopefully, they're they're gonna make it. Yep. And possibly split my strong hive. Um, so I have three going into the winter, just because if I have only have two going into the winter, I'm pretty much guaranteed to lose one. So I kind of would like to get through the winter with maybe two. Yeah, absolutely. And because you you also use quilt levels, don't you? I use what now? Uh, quilt levels. I think I saw that on your site somewhere. Oh, a, a quilt box? Yeah, quilt box. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, that was something. That was an experiment I did last winter. They're not. I, I don't know. 
see you're up in you're in the north island you guys don't really have like wet winters do you oh it, we do yeah some some oh you do absolutely it, it sometimes rains here for 30 days straight oh okay okay because I was talk, um, been, I was sort of talking to you know, do you know Rusty? She's she's got a blog. She just thinks she's near Seattle somewhere, and she she mentioned them about on her blog, and uh, so we built some last year as well. What do you, that seems that sounds familiar? I might have gotten the plans off of her website. Yeah. Do you know what it's called? I think it's Honey Bee Sweet, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I I link to her site off of my page where that, I have my that's photos. Right. We 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 are going to be interviewing her soon, so we'll um I'll talk to her more about that because it's 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 quite fascinating that they actually um help the bees keep the the hive you know um dry, and I think it actually does help with varroa mites too, with stopping varroa mm-hmm. mites. I uh, I learned after I built that box that that's kind of a standard piece of equipment in warre hives. Yeah, uh, yes, it's not a new idea; it's an old idea, but just it's, yeah. it seems to have lost. Well, I think probably because when Langstroth were commercialised, they probably um, removed that kind of those sort of things. They probably didn't think they were necessary. Or yeah, I'll I'll add that to the show notes as well because that's a good article it's about quilt levels. Yeah, that's great. So, so you're hoping to get another third hive this season, and then go to, go into your winter with three. That's a good good plan. Yeah, yeah. I I wish I had more space to devote to experimenting with top R and war a, um, there is a big interest in, uh, in both of those here in Portland. We have a, a very, a very experienced and knowledgeable hive builder. Um, uh, Matt Reed, his site is be thinking. Um, so he, he's, he create, he, uh, built, and sells high quality top bar and warrior and I'm, I'm definitely interested in those those styles doing natural comb and and whatnot yeah that's um definitely a good idea eh? well, i i know a guy in new zealand that does some warrior hives and he's a lot of good he has a lot of luck with them as, as well so it's good oh good. yeah but they're, they're they're hard on your back because you've got to under under <laughs> yeah the bottom supering is pretty rough yeah because i know that um the guy that invented them um his name's Warre, and he he had a lot, a lot of assistance apparently. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I, I you need to get assistance when you have those ones. You know, get some young strong people to help some, you. Some minions. That's it. You got to give minions. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Oh well, thanks a lot, James, for coming along today. It's been really good. And um, well, appreciate it. it. So people can find that Swarmy on the i App Store, eh? If they've got an iPhone. Yes. And, and I'll put your your uh, link to your website there as well. You got anything else you want to bring up? Well, I could, uh, you know, I could take, I could give you a, a handful of promo codes for that that you could put on your site so that people, when people go to look at the episode, they can get, they can just get Swarmy for free. Um, okay. And I can mail, yeah. Those, yeah, I can mail those to you, five or ten of those. And if people, if your listeners want to try it out, then they can, they can just get it for free. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. We could. Yeah, well, so so they'd be only be used once, eh? So I'll maybe maybe they make it the first ten people that email us back or something. Probably the best. Okay. Way to do it. Yeah. So if if yeah. you guys want a promo code, drop us an email, uh-huh. and um, we'll we'll pass those out rather than publish them on the internet site. So. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. So yeah, thanks for coming, James, and thanks for listening, everybody, and we'll uh, we'll talk to you next week. So long. <laughs>